want to welcome all of you. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Log Church. Thank you also for joining us at the cafe. We are honored to have you. And this week, we begin part one of our five-part series called When God Doesn't Make Sense. This is a really big series. Uh, we've been working on it. We've adapted it from another church uh, in Colorado called Life Church. And it's an awesome uh, series. So of course, we made it our own. And Pastor Mike and I are both going to be taking turns with it uh, through the summer here. So we're really excited about it. But we're going to be talking today about what to do when God seems inattentive. Because we've all had those moments that God seems like he's not working in a situation that we need him to work in. I remember standing in the middle of a long uh, campus, a long corridor in the middle of a, a campus of a Lancaster Bible College. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. It used to be Lancaster Bible College. It might be Lancaster uh, University now. But I believed that God had been calling me into ministry, and I wanted to go away to college. I didn't really have any former Bible, formal Bible training, so I believed that I had to go to Bible College in order to be able to work for a church. So I thought that this would be the right direction to go. Now, it was unfortunate because I had previous college experience before I became a Christian. I was going into business. And um, nobody told me whenever I signed up to go to college when I was younger that um, in order to succeed at college, you have to actually uh, go to the classes. I don't know if I don't know if any of you knew that, and uh, you have to actually know the material that's on the tests, like they made you like know the stuff, and I didn't know that, so I didn't do well in college. Well, when I realized that God was calling me into the ministry, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to learn the Bible, I'm going to do the best I can, and I'm going to go away, and uh, when I got back, I started to look at my finances, and I still had a lot of college debt from my previous college experience, and I also came to another realization, this one's even crazier, I realized that all colleges, including Christian colleges, expect you to pay to go to college. Like, they actually want money. And I was like, whoa, this is too much, too much reality. So my finances would not permit me to go to Bible college. And right around the same time, I received a job working at PNC Bank. It was like my dream job. I worked downtown. And I really wanted to do that. And I remember getting the job and going into my office and you know, going into the office at the bank, and I remember sitting there thinking, okay, well, God, I want to go to Bible college. I want to be a minister like you want me to, but you're like giving me all these directions away from that, and I couldn't figure out how to reconcile those two. It just seemed like God wasn't making sense. It seemed like he wasn't paying attention to the plan that I believed he had for me. Well, in hindsight, a year and a half later, it turns out if I would have gone away to Lancaster if I'd have been in Bible college. I most likely wouldn't have been working here at this church because when the position came open, I would have been away. And also, I wouldn't have probably be married right now to the person I'm married to, and it would have been a whole different life. And in hindsight, it's great, 2020 vision, right? Everybody has that. But there are a lot of situations that we face where we don't have that, do we? Where something happens in our lives, and you look at your life, and you're like, okay, I don't even understand why I went through that. Like, this doesn't even make any sense. I, years and years of trying to process it, you still can't figure out why you were permitted to experience that. And that's what our series is going to talk about. We're going to be talking about those kinds of circumstances. We're going to be talking about when we feel that God is not making sense. Because we've all been to churches and we've all heard the stories. You know the stories, the victory stories. You've heard about the man who lost his job and he goes to Starbucks and he prays, okay, Father, I just pray that you would give me an opportunity to have an open door and a new job. And when he opens his eyes, the CEO of a prominent corporation downtown is sitting across from him and he says, you know what? I I could tell by the way that you were sipping your latte that you would be a great asset to our company. And they hire him full time. They give him benefits. And by the way, we didn't have an opportunity to pass out Christmas bonuses or we had an overrun in Christmas bonuses. We had extra money. So we're just going to go ahead and give you that before you even start. So now you have extra money. I mean, we've heard those stories. They're great. Okay. You've You've heard those stories, and you're sitting there saying, okay, well, how do I pay my bills this week? I don't even want all that. I just want like a normal survival type thing. Or some of you are like, okay, I've been lonely for a long time, and you talk to another Christian person. They're like, okay, well, I was lonely too, and then I signed up for eHarmony, and the day that I signed up, somebody else signed up. It turns out that he used to be a model. 
And he signed up the same day I did. And we had one conversation online. And he met me at the door. And he is beautiful looking. And he makes really good money. And he loves God so much that he's memorized the Greek version of the New Testament. And... <clears throat> When we walk through the mall, people want us to put their, their, our pictures in their frame because our faces are like the faces that are in the picture frames that you buy, and you rip them and crumple them up and put your family's faces in. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, and then we had two dates, and we got married, and now we live happily ever after, and it's perfect. And you're like, okay, the last person I dated online, they look like sloth from the Goonies, okay? <laughs> and I, uh, that was an... Uh, upgrade from the previous person I dated. So I'm not even complaining. And you're like, I just want somebody that cares and I want a good person. So you look at the stories of victory and you look at your life and you're like, okay, I don't understand. This doesn't seem to make sense. Like, I feel like I'm doing right by God. I feel like I'm doing what God wants me to do. I feel like I'm, I'm trying to obey his word. I'm trying to know him more and I'm not hearing him or I'm not getting from him what he would want for me. What I want to share with you first when you're experiencing these kinds of things, and I'm going to give you some things that I just want you to try to work on in your own personal life and how you believe is the first is this. Just because God is silent does not mean that he is absent. That's the first thing. Just because God is silent does not mean that he is absent. Because we have a tendency to throw our hands up and say, where is God? I mean, where is he? I, I'm in this major crisis right now. I'm having problems healing. I'm having problems turning a corner. I can't figure out what to do. God is not there. Do not confuse God's silence with his absence. When we do that, it leads us away from God. But there are periods of time that I have to share with you and tell you that God is silent. And we're going to be examining a story like that today. We're going to be looking at the character of John the Baptist. What an interesting person John the Baptist is. He was Jesus' cousin. I don't know about you, but if you have a cool family, that pretty much trumps your cool family. Yeah, my cousin is Jesus. My cousin created the heavens and the earth, and he's God, and you know, he's really great. You're like, well, my cousin like, plays horseshoes at our family gathering. No, 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 my cousin's Jesus, okay? So John the Baptist was um, Jesus' cousin. On top of it, John the Baptist was a very prominent figure at the time. He had a large following of people that followed him everywhere. If you read the New Testament, you'll see that there are followers of John the Baptist that are still devoted to him even after he's died in the book of Acts. They still are connected and consider themselves his disciples. But John the Baptist was politically incorrect. He was. I mean, he was the most politically incorrect person probably that ever lived. He makes Donald Trump look like Joel Osteen, okay? I mean, that's how politically incorrect he was. He would get in your face. He would talk to you about your soul. He would talk to you about repenting. He would talk to you about things that you were doing wrong. And he didn't care what anyone said about him. And people took to him. The common people followed him. That's why you have thousands of people that were following him. But he was also a little weird. He would wear camel skin clothing and sheepskin clothing and he'd live in the wilderness and he'd eat milk and honey or I'm sorry honey and locusts I should say he would eat honey and locusts in the wilderness so he'd be someone you'd be like he's really cool but I want to admire him from a distance I kind of don't want to get near him because he's a little bit out there but John the Baptist was a leader in his time at the same time there's a king his name is King Herod Antipas King Herod was ruling, and one day he decided that it would be a good idea for him to start making googly eyes at his sister-in-law, his brother's wife. His brother's name is Philip. And so he makes you know, the googly eyes at Philip's wife, and he decides it would be a really good idea if he divorced his wife, and if Herodias, Philip's wife, would divorce Philip, and then Herod and Herodias would be together, and it would be like an awesome match. So that's exactly what they did. No one really could say anything because he was the king. If you had a problem with the king, they would execute you. So it's a big difference in where we're at today. And so Herod marries Herodias, and John the Baptist openly condemns their relationship. He talks about the sinfulness of their relationship. And this puts John the Baptist in the position that we're going to be examining for the rest of our time together. Look with me, if you will, in Mark chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. It says, 
For it was Herod who had sent out and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias is disgusted that John the Baptist is getting all up in her business. And because of her desire, she tells her husband, hey, Herod, get this guy and arrest him. So Herod has John the Baptist arrested. He is put in prison. Look with me further in verse 19 and 20. It says, and Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was righteous and a holy man. So Herodias tells her husband, why are we even wasting time keeping him in prison? This is stupid. Let's just kill him. I mean, it's none of his business what we do. I don't care who he thinks he is. If we put him to death, we could save taxpayer money or whatever. And Herod won't do that. He won't cross the line. The reason why is because he believes, because he was, John the Baptist was a very holy and righteous person, and he didn't want to cross that line. He also knows that John the Baptist is a political leader, and if he were to execute John the Baptist, it would cause an insurrection. So Herodias is steaming. The Bible says that she bore a grudge upon John the Baptist, even though he was in prison. The moral of the story so far, folks, is women are pretty and they smell good, but if you cross them, they'll cut you, okay? That's what you want to get so far. She has hatred, seething hatred for John the Baptist. How dare he say anything about what me and Herod have done? How dare he say anything about our divorces? I will get him, not now, but soon. Now, we can focus just on this part of the story, but the most interesting part about this story is not what's taking place between these three characters, but it's what isn't taking place, and that is that Jesus is nowhere on the scene. We don't see him standing by his cousin John as he's unlawfully arrested. We don't see him standing counseling Herodias not to want to kill John. We don't see that. In fact, we don't see Jesus at all. And John is in prison, and I'd imagine he was probably thinking, okay, my cousin, Jesus, who is God, is going to come and bail me out. My cousin who does all these cool things, and he waits and nothing. And he waits, and nothing. And he waits, and waits, and waits. And finally, depression and discouragement set in. I mean, wouldn't you be discouraged too? You know that there's someone that can help you. You know it's within his realm of power to do so, but he doesn't. So in his discouragement, John speaks to his own disciples. After hearing that Jesus is doing crazy things, he's turning water into wine, he's walking on water, he's raising the dead, he's ministering to people, he's teaching, he's calming storms. He hears all this, but he's still in prison. This is easy. Just get me out of prison and let me minister for you like I was doing before. So John has a conversation with his disciples, and he sends them to Jesus Look with me in Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 3. It says, And when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? He sends a very bold question. He says, Really, am I mistaken in worshiping you? Am I mistaken, though I believe what I saw when I baptized you, though I believe what I know about you? Are you really the one or am I wasting my time? You need to know that God is bigger than your questions. It's okay to have questions. It's okay to not know everything. I used to think when I first became a Christian that in order to worship God, you had to like check your brains at the door, that God didn't want you to ask hard things. But after reading the New Testament, after looking at the Old Testament and the Psalms and seeing how people interacted with God... God isn't like that at all. In fact, many of his heroes ask questions. Just simply read the Psalms. Look at what happens when the psalmists are depressed or discouraged about things that are going on in their lives. They say, God, what's going on? I mean, why are you letting this happen? What's going on? Why are we not delivered from this? Look at the prophets when they saw the nation of Israel sieged by godless people. God, why are you letting this happen to your people? These are your people. Why? They would cry out to God these questions. You know, God can handle your questions. Your questions aren't going to break God. 
You're not going to say, why is this happening to me? And God's going to go, oh, man, he stumped me. I can't answer. I don't know. Listen, he's bigger than that. His shoulders are broader than that. He can handle the honesty and the integrity of what's going on in your heart. Just like Jesus is going to handle the question of John the Baptist right now. Look with me in Matthew chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. It says, Jesus answered them and said, Go and tell John all that you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. And the poor have the good news preached to them. And then he says one thing at the end that's very interesting, and we're tempted to gloss over this. This is, in my opinion, the central point of the message that he's trying to give to John. He says, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Now, offended, what does that mean? Like offended because I have a bumper sticker, offended, like what are we talking about? The Greek word for offended here is a word called skondalizo. Scandalizo has a bunch of different meanings. It could mean disgusted, it could mean repulsed, but it also could mean something as simple as tripping, being tripped up or stumbling over, being, being um, in the state of stumbling. So what he's telling John's disciples is go back, say that I'm the fulfillment of all these prophecies, this is what I'm doing, but also say, blessed is the person that doesn't get tripped up by what I'm doing. And I'm gonna add here, not tripped up by what I'm doing, but tripped up by what I'm not doing. Because did Jesus say here he's going to break John out of prison? Did he say that? Somebody say yes or no. No. Did he say, just tell John Herod's going to change his mind, he's going to be good, and I'll see him at Thanksgiving dinner. Did he say that? Did they celebrate Thanksgiving? That's the other question. No, they didn't. I just realized that. They probably didn't celebrate Thanksgiving. Things you learn as you're speaking, right? Okay, so... John has no promises here. All Jesus is doing is telling him, don't be offended. Don't trip up on the fact of what I'm doing. And why would he trip up? Well, let's see. Um, Jesus doesn't even go visit him, does he? Jesus isn't even going to bring him a care package. He sends him a group text. That's what he did. He sends his groupies back to him. And do you ever get a group text and they're asking you something? You're like, okay, you don't even care enough about me to give me an individual text. I deserve my own thread, bro, okay? John doesn't even get that from Jesus. He sent, just, tell, just give him this message and tell him that, you know, don't be offended. And yeah, of course I'm the one because I'm doing all these things. And so the disciples go back and John is still in prison and still waiting. Second thing you need to understand when you're in these types of situations, when God appears like he's inattentive, is next of all, you don't have to understand the plan to trust God's purpose. You don't have to understand the plan. Some people say that you do have to. And I want to tell you that if you understand what's going on in your life, and you understand why you've been permitted to go through certain things, that's great. Praise God. That's discernment. That's a gift of God. That's wonderful but it's not necessary because some of you, you don't understand. Some of you people are like, well, wonder why that's happening to him. They don't know and you don't know and we just don't know because you don't have to understand the plan of God to trust the purpose of God. You still have to believe that God has a purpose. You still have to believe that God is at work. And when we start to grapple with the plan, when we start to believe that the plan is more important than the purpose, then we lose sight of the meaning of God's purpose. We lose sight of his presence. We lose sight of our faith. Don't be offended. Don't stumble. Don't trip up. That's the message here. So what's happening with John? He gets the message. He's like, okay, well, maybe it's going to turn a corner. He's still in prison. He's still waiting. He's still waiting. Meanwhile, while he's in prison, King Herod decides to throw a huge keg party. It's a big party where he invites all his friends, all the people around in his palace with his new wife, Herodias. And they're having this party and they're all celebrating and they are drinking and they're drinking a lot. Back in that day, if you were able to afford it, you were wealthy enough, you could have a celebration or a party that lasted days. Imagine if you got a wedding invitation that was like a five-day wedding. You'd be like, no way, okay? That's the way it was back then. They're having a party, everybody's drinking way too much and King Herod and King Herodias are celebrating. Okay, as the conclusion of the party, at the conclusion of the party, out from behind the scenes comes a young lady. The Bible says that this is Herodias' daughter. 
the daughter of King Herod's wife. Now, I don't know if this is his niece. I'm not sure what the connection is with his brother, but she comes out and she begins to dance for him. She's dancing in the middle of the king's courtyard there. And as she dances, because how drunk the king is and because he's a pig, he thinks that this is really awesome that she's dancing like this. Now, the holy man in me, the righteous person in me, wants to think that she's just dancing to some really cool 80s techno music, you know? Like, you know, how the, you know, the sounds of the, you know that sound? Like, that's what you hear, and she's just dancing, and it's kind of innocent, and everybody's part, maybe she's watering the lawn, you know what I'm talking about? Did you ever water the, you know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. You know how to water the lawn. Okay, so she, I'm thinking she's doing something innocent, but really, based on what we know about the king, based on what we know about his wife, based on what we know about this situation, she's probably twerking, okay? She's doing something really inappropriate. Somebody asked me as they were leaving church last night, how do you twerk? I'm like, I'm not going to show you how to do that, <laughs> and I don't want you Googling it either, okay? So... She does this dance, and the king is feeling no pain. He's drunk. He goes, boy, your dancing is so great. And you know something? Because of how good of a dancer, I will give you anything you want in the kingdom. You name it, you got it. Anything you want, I'll give it to you. So the young lady's there, and she's like, I don't know. Do I want a pony? Or maybe I'll get a Ferrari. No, but what I really want, and then I imagine her voice deepens. She's like, John the Baptist head on a platter. That's what she asks for. She says, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. The king is in a very difficult position right now. He just made a drunken promise to a person of anything she wanted, and what she wants is the execution of John the Baptist. So look with me at this story and see how this unfolds. In Mark chapter 6, verse 26, it says, And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. You see, let's get back into the context. Back in this day, if you were a leader or a political official like the king, if you made a public proclamation or you made a statement like this and you went back on your word and you lied about it, you would be considered a bad leader and it would weaken your authority. In this day and age, if you lie or make a mistruth or say a bad statement as a political leader, you just run for president. Sorry. <laughs> Pastor Mike, when did you get here? <laughs> but it was a really big deal back then. She, he couldn't break his oath. He couldn't go backwards. So this is the part of the story I love. This is my favorite because what happens then is John the Baptist is in prison. He's about to be executed. And just as that happens, lightning starts to strike in the sky. The earth rattles. The chains are broken from John's legs. And as it turns out, the gates are ripped apart. He's pulled out by an angel and he's escorted to a beautiful field to meet Jesus. And Jesus is waiting there. And Jesus has prepared this beautiful bride for him that's been waiting to marry John the Baptist. And she's like a camel hair, uh, camel hair suit wearing model. Okay. And they're going to be married there together. And they're going to live happily ever after serving Jesus because John the Baptist shouldn't have been in prison. And he most definitely shouldn't have been executed. That's the way I would have wrote the story, right? That's the way you would have wrote the story. That's what we would have said about the way this story should end. But how does it really end? Look with me in Mark chapter 6, verse 27 and 28. It says, immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him and in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl and the girl gave it to her mother. And that is the end of the story. That's it. That's it. So I looked a lot. I read a lot. I read the story a lot and the other gospels, looked over it, okay? I read the commentaries because I want to give you like the church answer of why this happened. I do. I want to give you like that really wise, like Pastor Sam is so insightful answer of why John the Baptist was murdered for no reason, and here's what I could come up with after the past week of studying. You ready? It's real, real deep. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why John was permitted by God to die 
in this way. I don't know. I want to challenge you as a Christian to be uncomfortable at times with I don't know. I want you in your life to not always be so adamant to know the answers of what's going on, but still be strong and devoted to God and believing that God is who he says he is. I don't understand the plan here. I don't know where it fits into God's big scale plan. When we get to heaven, I'm sure we will. However, this is what I do know. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. The Bible says that many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. My plans aren't his plans, and his purpose is unmovable. So I could plan things to go a certain way, But if it's against his purpose, his purpose will be established. And I have to find, as a follower of Christ, greater joy in his purpose than I do in the plans of my life. When we do that, then we're able to handle and navigate the waters when it seems like God isn't making sense. What we have a tendency to do, what I want to do, what you want to do, is we want to Say, okay, well, if God is supposed to be good, if he's supposed to be righteous, if he's supposed to love me, if he's supposed to do all these things that he says he's going to do, why am I going through this? Why did I experience this? How is this a part of my life and his plan for me? And what happens is it's our nature to want to doubt the goodness of God. It's our nature to want to kind of say, okay, well, I thought God was a certain way and he's not. But the most important thing that I could teach you when you're going through these I don't know circumstances is this. Never interpret the goodness of God through your circumstances. Interpret your circumstances through the goodness of God. Because God can only be good. He is always only good. He is righteous. He is perfect. He is beyond us. He is perfect. And if I believe that God is who he says he is, that there is no shadow of turning in him, that he is the author of all good things, that he is perfect and right in his judgments, if I believe that, I can interpret my circumstances a different way. I can go through these I don't know experiences. I can go through these things of my past and process them in the joy of knowing that I serve a God that is good, that he is always good, he is always there, and he is always present. Though at times he may be silent, he never stops working out his purpose. If you think about it, one of the most important events of the history of time hinged on a moment when God didn't seem like he was making sense. As Jesus hung upon the cross, bleeding out his life for the sins of the world, he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? The first time, We have that instance taking place. And we read and we've watched and we've heard this story. And for three days, the disciples had that hopelessness. How could this be the plan of God? How could this be the plan of God that Jesus would die in such a way? Giving way, of course, to the victory of the resurrection of Christ. That's not a plan that I would have come up with. But God's purposes were firmly rooted and his foundation firmly established in the death and resurrection of Christ. We serve a God of purpose. We don't have to understand the plans to know that we serve a God whose purpose is to work out everything for his good pleasure and for his goodness. He is always good. In your life, he is always good. He will never be anything but good. He is perfect. We have to trust him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you I thank you for your word and your honesty about these stories. I pray in Jesus' name that whatever we're going through, the I don't knows, I pray that we would not be shaken by that, but that we would be established on your purpose, knowing that you are wise, that you and your ways are above ours. And I pray that you'd fill us with that purpose, allow us to tolerate 
and navigate the plan. I pray if there's anyone here right now or at the cafe and you do not know where you would spend eternity, if this is something for you that is unsettling, if you've never trusted in Christ as your Savior, today I'd like to ask you to make that decision. If you feel that God is leading you, I want you to pray this prayer. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's the work that God is doing in your heart. I want you just to pray this prayer with me. My Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe he gave his life for the sins of this world. And he rose again to conquer death. I accept his forgiveness. And right now, I turn my life over to you. I repent. Right now I ask to be saved. If you just prayed that prayer and you meant it and God is working in your heart, I want you to write that on your connection card. Say, today I made my peace with God. You trusted in Christ. But Father, I pray, help us to be established in your purpose. Help us to love your purpose. Help us to follow you no matter what's taking place in the plans of our lives, knowing that you are always good. Your ways are always right. In Jesus' name.